If you're gonna go headless or you're thinking about going headless, you will know that your web experience will be built on a JavaScript framework. And the problem is that JavaScript frameworks are evolving all the time. There's new terminology, there's new technology, there's new types of architectures, lots of different ways of doing things, and it's so hard to keep up. And one of the areas that's getting a lot of airtime right now is static site generation. Now, it's not as simple as it sounds. It actually involves many different types of technology, all the way from the JavaScript framework work to how the site is delivered. So what I'm going to do is hopefully demystify this area, hopefully help you understand a little bit more about how all these frameworks come together. So let's not waste any time. Let's get to it. Okay, what is static site generation? It's when you take your dynamic app, your React, your Vue app, the app that you've built on top of your headless architecture, and you put it through a process which turns it into a static site. So it takes all the variants of screens and pages in your app and then turns them into static HTML, static CSS, and even in some cases, some static data files. So why would you do that? So the first reason to do it is one of SEO. Having static files perform much better in terms of search engine optimization. You'll also get much better performance because you're dealing with a static file which you don't have to generate and you don't have to do any API calls. And if you're on a CDN, you'll get even better performance. Some of the benefits include security, because there are no API calls, it's just a static file, and it's come from a CDN. And also the architecture is really simple and therefore it can be much more robust. So before getting into the detail, let's look at the high level architecture and look at what components are involved in actually generating static sites. First of all, we have the JavaScript frameworks. And these are libraries used by developers to actually build the customer interface. They're typically free and open source and tend to be component based. They'll help manage things like the state in the application, connections to backend APIs, and just the overall assembly of components into a UI interface. No doubt you've heard of these frameworks. They're things like React, Vue, Svelte, and Angular. So the next components we'll talk about are web application frameworks. And these actually build on top of the JavaScript frameworks, but they solve problems around the wider application development process. You know, the things like routing to pages, PWA features like offline content, page caching, pre-rendering, and a bunch of developer tools. They also provide the deployment architectures for static site generation or things like server-side rendering. Again, these frameworks tend to be free and open source software. And for React development, you'll use frameworks like Gatsby or Next. And for Vue, you'll use Nuxt.js. And for Svelte, you'll use SvelteKit. So the third component is the ADN or Application Delivery Network. These are commercial products, but they often provide you with a free tier. So what they actually do is host your website. They'll host all of those static files and they tend to host them on a CDN. So they'll handle all of that continuous integration and that continuous delivery process for you. So they'll handle all the automatic generation of pages based on changes to code or changes to content. They'll also provide preview features and some basic analytics. So the application delivery network are Netlify, who were one of the first and are not attached to any particular framework. There's Vercel, the company behind Next.js, but you can use other frameworks with their platform, even though they are really optimized for Next.js. So let's get down to how it all works. First of all, the web application framework runs within the continuous integration and the continuous delivery process. And that's an automated process that generates those static HTML and CSS files that you need for your website. So at the start, during this process, the web application will work out what pages need to be pre-rendered. Now, if you have dynamic pages, like those coming from a CMS, there are hooks in these frameworks that allow you to call out and get those list of pages from CMS or even e-commerce platforms. Once the process has that list of pages, it can then start pre-rendering them and generating those static HTML files and static CSS files. Those files can then be lifted and pushed to the CDN. So this whole process can be automated and can even be triggered by an API. So in effect, what you can do is connect your headless CMS to this process. And then when a page is published, you can then trigger the whole process to go and regenerate those static pages. And as you might already have guessed, there are downsides to this approach. 
One of the big downsides is the time it takes to generate pages. It's actually fairly linear. So if it takes one second to generate a page and you have tens of thousands of pages, it could take hours to generate a site. And if you double the number of pages, it doubles the time it takes to generate that website. And therefore for a larger web application, choosing complete static site generation is really a non-starter. Another consideration might be that of dynamic paths. And what I mean by that is if you have lots Lots and lots of lists that are generated by user input and there are lots of dimensions for that user input like a multi-dimensional deep classification on product listers it could be quite tricky to generate those static lists and especially if they're based on things like prices that are changing all of the time another big consideration is that of real-time data if you have real-time data you can deal with it through api calls at the client side but if you have a lot of it it starts to break the model and another big consideration is that of personalization if you want to do more more than just page variant personalization and you're doing multi-level content personalization, that could also be quite tricky. So just some final thoughts. If it makes sense to go down a static site generation route, do it. However, if you do find it starting to get more and more complicated, you're adding more and more pieces into the architecture to fix problems that you're having, it's probably not the right solution. Static site generation is just another tool in the toolbox. And I always work on the premise, use the right tool for the right job. If you think it's complicated now, it will get much more complicated later on. It'll get harder to scale and much harder to maintain in the long term. It may be better to take a completely different approach or even a hybrid approach. So there you have it. That's a quick run through of server-side generation. I hope that helps demystify some of the terms that are out there and help you understand what the new pieces of technologies do that developers and technologists keep throwing out there. And that's all we've got time for right now. So if you enjoyed this and you found it useful, please scroll down a little bit, press that like button so more people can see this video and get help from it. But for now, it's time to say goodbye and I'll see you next time.